Good evening. I'm Stephen Walt, the Academic Dean here at the Kennedy School. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the 2004 S.T. Lee Lecture in Military History and Strategy. Uh, the Lee Lecture is made possible by a generous gift from Seng T. Lee, a distinguished citizen of Singapore, devoted student of military history, and friend of the school. The purpose of this lecture is to encourage serious thought about issues of military history and strategy, and we're very grateful to Mr. Lee for making this lecture possible. Uh, when the Cold War ended about 15 years ago, a lot of scholars and pundits argued that we had reached the end of history. We no longer had to worry about the problem of war and conflict. Uh, there was a widespread sense that people who studied international security were dinosaurs. It was time to put them out to pasture. Uh, sadly, this prophecy proved false. The years since have made it clear that these basic issues of international security remain all too serious. Since 1990, we've fought wars in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Kosovo. We've deployed sizable military forces in Bosnia, Somalia, and other places. We've come close to war on a number of other occasions. Wars and rumors of wars continue to dominate the headlines. War is still with us. And if there's any good news in that particular reality, it's the fact that we still have experts like Anthony Cordesman to help us understand the modern face of warfare. I imagine that everyone here has read his work, seen his TV commentary, heard his voice on the radio, consistently offering thoughtful and well-informed analyses of contemporary security issues. It's our great privilege to have him here as the ST Lee lecturer. Uh, Mr. Cordesman holds the Arlie A. Burke Chair in Strategy at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. He served in a variety of government positions, including formerly as National Security Assistant to Senator John McCain, as Director of Intelligence Assessment in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, as well as stints in the State Department, the NATO International Staff, and the Department of Energy. He is the author of more than 20 books, and some of these books really deserve to be called tomes if you've seen them, including the Iraq War, Saudi Arabia Enters the 20th Century, The Lessons of Afghanistan, Terrorism, Asymmetric Warfare, and Weapons of Mass Destruction, among many others. He is also the recipient of the Department of Defense Distinguished Service Medal, a former adjunct professor of National Security Studies at Georgetown, and the National Security Analyst for ABC News. Please join me in welcoming Anthony Cordesman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for coming tonight. I'm going to try to build on not so much what I've written, but what I've lived. And that is lived in the US government, both directly and as a consultant, through a whole series of wars and military actions. And one way to learn military history is to live it. It's not the best way either in terms of objectivity or the ability to examine history in the light to the full knowledge of the facts. But I am struck as I begin this speech by the fact I first came into the national security business in the early 1960s. And then it was what could be called the group of neoliberals that fatally misinterpreted the grand strategic realities of Vietnam. Today, as I study the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, I have the odd feeling that I have lived through military history to the point where I have come full circle. I'm now studying the mistakes of a group of neoconservatives in Iraq rather than neoliberals in Vietnam. And time and again, I'm struck by the ways in which our approach to the war in Iraq repeats the strategic, tactical, and intelligence mistakes of Vietnam, and indeed of most of the other wars that I've lived through. There are many reasons for that feeling. I recognize tactical mistakes, mistakes in human intelligence, ways of underestimating the enemy, the exaggeration of technology over human factors, failures to integrate civil and military operations, and simple errors, like rotating troops too quickly and the resulting lack of continuity in leadership and area expertise. 
But the truly serious problems I find in re-examining these wars are the problems in grand strategy. They are problems in strategic assessment of the need for the conflict and of its political and diplomatic impacts. They are problems in planning and executing conflict termination and in using stability operations and nation building to achieve the desired grand strategic outcome. As Alfred Thayer Mahan put it in one of his writings, in a building, however fair and beautiful, the superstructure, the end result is radically marred and imperfect if the foundation be insecure. So if the strategy is wrong, the skill of the general, the valor of the soldier, the brilliancy of the victory, however otherwise decisive, fail of their effect. These patterns are too, all too clear in the wars that I have lived through. Our failures in grand strategy and in our strategic assessment of events in Vietnam and in shaping our proposals for the termination of that conflict have ultimately had a relatively happy ending given all the predictions made at the time. But the only dominoes that ever fell in that conflict were Cambodia and Laos, two nations we dragged into the war, and both nations are paying for the result. The cost in American and Vietnamese lives and the resulting divisions in our society still affect the present presidential campaign. The impact of that war also helps explain why the U.S. military was so reluctant to take on the burden of stability operations and did not want to prepare for so many aspects of the counterinsurgency war it now has to fight. Denial and a desire to avoid are not the same as planning and preparation. In another war, it was the same Republican neorealists that finally withdraw, withdrew from Vietnam that almost immediately went on to badly misread the situation in Angola and the dangers and costs of fighting a proxy war in that country. The United States provoked a Soviet and Cuban response that it could not counter. This led to America's proxies being defeated in 1976 to some 15 years of bitter civil war and in the process, it was our initial Marxist enemy which became our de facto ally. The strange American grand strategic illusion that the world wants to converge around our cultural and political values was at least partly responsible for our inability to understand the dynamics of the situation in Lebanon when we intervened in 1982. We had no real grand strategy. Our strategic assessments were wrong, and we treated an ongoing civil war in many ways as if it was over. Our grand strategy for the Gulf War against Iraq in 1990 and 1991 failed to look in any depth beyond the liberation of Kuwait. Our strategic assessments in that war strongly exaggerated Iraq's conventional capabilities and somewhat ironically now sharply underestimated its weapons of mass destruction. In retrospect, we did not suffer from overestimating its conventional capabilities and the necessary size of coalition forces. But if we've ever learned the lesson that all battles must end, it did not lead us to formulate any coherent plan for the termination of the Gulf War. If anything, the extent to which we romanticized the scale of our military victory in the Gulf War and failed to fully examine our reasons for holding at the Iraqi border was one reason that neoconservatives and many others came to feel that launching the Iraq War would have such an easy aftermath. 
In another case, even today, it is difficult to understand how we blundered from a humanitarian mission in Somalia into a war against its tribal and political culture, and did so without understanding its recent history and without a clear grand strategy or realistic strategic assessment for what was going to happen. Moreover, we had no real plan for conflict termination and stability other than what Henry Kissinger would call a triumph of hope over experience. We have reason to be proud of our role in Bosnia and Kosovo, but not from a historical viewpoint of any aspect of our original grand strategies or of our strategic assessment of the situation before we began to use force in either country. In fact, there's a very good doctor's thesis to be written on which was most decoupled from reality. The liberal grand strategic goals set forth in the Dayton Accords, or the neoconservative goals set forth for Iraq. Our grand strategy in Kosovo, such as it was, essentially moved from reliance on threats to escalating with air power until we won. Our conflict termination strategy was in Kuwait, and our stability operations are still in progress half a decade after our last combat survey. If we look at our intervention in Afghanistan following 9-11, we need to remember that this intervention followed three decades of failure to properly estimate the risks posed by Islamist extremism. The often brilliant mix of U.S. tactics and technology that drove the Taliban from power, again, were not coupled to any grand strategy for conflict termination, stability operations, or even for dealing with the inevitable mutation and evolution of al-Qaeda. In spite of all the lessons of the Balkans, we still did not have a plan for nation building, and we failed to secure the country immediately after the fall of the Taliban and during the period of a power vacuum where that would have been relatively simple and easy. In fact, we were so isolated from the realities in Afghanistan that a whole military literature briefly flourished about how we could use air power and special forces and a token military presence on the ground to quickly and easily defeat our enemies in asymmetric wars. For those of you who've already forgotten, this was one of the arguments that a number of neoconservatives raised in arguing that the US intervention in Iraq would be a cakewalk. Yet we not only are still fighting the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan with some 18,000 troops, we still have no solution to the fact that Afghanistan's economy is a drug economy, to building effective Afghan security and military forces, or to ensure that there is a political system which goes beyond having an election and to push on government. To turn to the present war in Iraq, it's all too easy to blame America's neoconservatives for what's happening and there is much to blame them for. The grand strategy for using Iraq to transform the Middle East was at best ridiculous. Their strategic assessment of Iraq was also wrong in far more important ways than their assessment of the potential threat posed by Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. They were fundamentally wrong about how the Iraqi people would view the US and British invasion. They were equally wrong about the problems of governance that would follow. And in underestimating the difficulties of creating a new form of government that was legitimate in Iraqi eyes. They misjudged the relevance and influence of Iraqi exiles. They misjudged the scale of Iraq's economic, ethnic, 
and demographic problems. They failed to see the need for serious stability operations and nation building. They did not see the risk of insurgency and they assumed that we were so right that all of our allies and the world would soon be forced to follow our lead. As is now all too clear, there was no real grand strategy after Saddam's fall. And our strategic assessments were horribly slow to improve. We wasted a year after our apparent military victory, sometimes living in a state of ideological denial. We occupied Iraq as pro-councils rather than moving forward to create a legitimate government. We delayed in creating effective Iraqi security and military forces. Our aid efforts faltered in a mix of uncoordinated, ideologically driven efforts to suddenly transform the Iraqi economy into a model of the American economy mixed with bureaucratic fumbling. And what realism there is in our present approach to the war after the war in Iraq has been thrust upon neoconservatives after the fact. To the extent we may be evolving a workable approach to grand strategy, that evolution has been shaped largely by the people that neoconservatives chose to ignore in choosing the way they went to war in the first place. Moreover, our military approach has shifted from a technology-driven version of a revolution in military affairs and net-centric warfare to a human factors-driven counterinsurgency campaign dominated by boots on the ground, by older technologies and weapons, by area expertise and asymmetric warfare. Before we go too far in blaming those responsible for today's mistakes, however, it's important to note that much of our military history is one of oversimplifying grand strategy and war. It is a history of failing to see the complexities and risks in going into combat. It is a failure to educate ourselves to honestly address the problem of conflict termination, and above all, the need to make the proper efforts to shape a meaningful peace before, during, and after the fighting. And if we look beyond Iraq, we find ourselves now struggling to use history to understand a much broader ideological and cultural crisis that has bred a level of violent Islamic extremism that not only threatens our country and our Western allies, but above all, the moderate secular development of the Islamic and Arab world. We today often focus narrowly on a war on terrorism, and we are only beginning to understand that in grand strategic terms, the struggle is religious, cultural, political, economic, and demographic, not one that can be addressed by force or counterterrorism alone. Our strategic assessments often ignore the culture and history of the region, and some border on xenophobia. We find it difficult to face the sheer complexity of the forces at work and history's warning that such struggles generally play out over a period of decades and will last long after today's terrorist and extremist movements are largely forgotten. Our grand strategy, to the extent we have one, seems to have cons consist of hoping that we can use force or the threat of force to make the greater Middle East democratic on our terms and that all good things will then follow. We focus on democratization, which is only one political dimension of a broader struggle. Even then, we seem to have forgotten the history and risks of revolution, forgotten the need for stable political parties with meaningful secular goals, for the rule of law, and for political checks and balances as the preconditions for democracy 
and for votes. We ignore the need to encourage a form of evolution which mixes more patient political reform with economic, demographic, and cultural reform. Regardless of party, we seem unwilling to face the fact that the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict interacts on an ongoing basis with the war on terrorism, or the extent to which our grand strategic failures in Iraq have so far aided the causes of Islamic extremism and argued, or angered, sorry, the Arab and Islamic worlds. Ironically, American conservatives, moderates, and liberals now seem united in making the same grand strategic mistakes. Let me conclude by making one thing clear in saying this. The last thing I am arguing on the basis of the lessons I have lived through is that military history teaches us that the United States can turn away from the world, that it should not play the role of a great power or that Americans can live in a world where they do not have to use military force. Our problem in using military history is not that it teaches us to not engage. It is rather to use military history to learn how to engage far more wisely. We need to improve the linkages that both historians and the practical users of history make between grand strategy, the history of battles, and the history of conflict termination, nation building, and stability operations. Today, these linkages are simply far too weak. And the end result is that our politicians, our policy makers, our military planners, and our intelligence analysts are simply not properly educated to deal with the broader realities of war and the uses of military force. Clausewitz saw these risks all too clearly in his writings on the principles of war. He noted that what he called friction not only dominated the course of battles, but the ability to use military means to achieve political ends. In one passage of his book, he describes the purpose of military history as follows. Only the study of military history is capable of giving those with no experience of their own a clear picture of the friction of the whole machine. Our problem is we do not look at the whole machine. Far more bluntly, Major General F.C. Fuller, perhaps the most realistic thinker about modern armored warfare in the period before World War II, made the point about military history that unless history can teach us to think about the future, the history of war is nothing more than a bloody romance. All of these meanings, all of these points take on special meaning today. We live in an era of asymmetric wars where the ability to use military forces to shape politics, ideology, peacemaking, stability, and nation-building operations have far more importance than the ability to defeat conventional enemies. We need to re-examine military history in ways that help us to understand that world. We need to understand that there is not going to be any end of, victory, uh, end of history. There's not going to be any sudden convergence around one set of values or political system. And there is not going to be any form of globalism where economics and civil society smoothly unite the world. If anything, the emerging challenges we face in grand strategy are far more diverse and complex than during the Cold War, and far less tied to the cultures and values that we have shared with other Western nations. We need to remember, too, that hubris is followed by nemesis, that we have to remember the right aspects of the past, and we have to learn grand strategy if we are to shape the right future. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Uh, uh, superbly insightful, and I might add, beautifully timed speech. Uh, it's, it's clear that a student of military strategy understands the importance of sticking to a timetable uh, brilliantly. We have time for questions. Uh, I see one familiar face by the microphones. There are microphones both yeah. upstairs and down, and uh, the first question goes to Professor Allison. Before he speaks, though, let me just say, please identify yourselves, please keep your questions short, and please make sure they end in a question mark. Tony, thanks very much. A brilliant uh, overview, and I want to ask a question that's a little complicated, uh, uh, but that goes back to a debate that we've been having here locally. In terms of what's happening in Iraq today that the U.S. finds itself facing, uh, you would say it is an example of X, and I want to know first what's the category that you would think of it. Some would say counterinsurgency or insurgency and counterinsurgency. Well, what do you call it? And secondly, which is like what previous examples that you think are sufficiently similar to offer some lessons? And thirdly, which might look like some other examples, but which you think are not very good examples because they don't belong to the same category of X or alternatively, there's too many things that are different. And then finally, uh, in that, in that uh, format, the measures of success or failure, the factors that you would look at for measures of success or failure for countries like us who were engaged in encounters like the one we're in there now? Well, they're good questions, Graham, but uh, let me say I wouldn't categorize it. I think that's one of the great problems. Wars are very different. The pressures that shape grand strategy certainly always have links to other conflicts and parallels in individual issues. But when you start trying to understand Iraq as if it was Afghanistan or Vietnam or the Philippines or any other conflict, the search for a categorization becomes part of the problem, not part of the solution. It is accepting the complexity of Iraq on its own terms that is critical and then breaking out the parts where you can learn from other conflicts and other models. Certainly we can learn a great deal about counterinsurgency activities and stability operations from other conflicts. But in some cases the lessons come from Vietnam and in some cases they come from Kosovo and in some cases, they simply come from issues like the British invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, military history should not consist of the search for parallels. It should consist of how you use history to understand the present in all its complexity and depth. And I think that is particularly clear in this case. Iraq is not a model of Germany or Japan. It is not a model of a weak, underdeveloped country. It is culturally radically different from the cases that we as a country have dealt with, and it exists in an area where the values of colonialism are really no longer relevant, even though in some cases you could describe the British creation of Iraq as one of the last vestiges of colonialism and the British Empire. The argument I would give you is when you look at the variables you have to address to deal with Iraq, at an absolute minimum you have to deal with its economy, its politics, its religion, its ethnic differences, it's tribalism. You have to deal with the impact of Saddam Hussein, and the list goes on to our impact. And it is the willingness to address those in grand strategic terms which is vital. I find this search <coughs> to have the war that we already fought become the model of the war we're now fighting 
to be a classic example of trying to fight the last war you won over again, regardless of the circumstances. Thank you for your excellent lecture this evening. My name is Mary Casey. I'm from Derry, or Londonderry, in Northern Ireland, where we have had the British Army uh, installed by that old gas yard wall that Phil Coulter talked, science, um, wrote about. Um, my question really is a question in relation to what is your view of government's uh, use of military in order to uh, exec exert control on countries and the military's uh, military being exploited by government and used by government to that effect? If you look at the history of the world since the end of World War II, there was a study done by the Center of Naval Analysis, and in that study they found that the lowest level of major wars in terms of internal civil conflicts or border conflicts they could find on any given day was, I think, something like 27 conflicts. The average was about 35. The number of times that you have to intervene to use force to deal with political issues on a humanitarian level or other levels is simply a fact of life. If you look at that same history, you'll see that the United States used military force demonstratively for humanitarian purposes, intervening outside the context of the Cold War some 240 times between 1945 and 1990. In many cases, that intervention served the needs of the peoples involved. In some cases, and I've cited them, it didn't. So there are no rules here. You cannot equate Rwanda to Northern Ireland. The issue always on the part of governments is how well have they assessed the situation? Can force actually be used? Are you willing to devote the resources in the time? Do you have the ability to integrate the use of force into broader political and economic solutions. Are the costs going to be lower than the costs of not using force? Not only to your own strategic interests, but the peoples involved. And that is why each engagement becomes an issue on its own. If there were neat, clear rules, we'd get it right every time. There aren't. And one of our greatest problems is often the tendency to oversimplify, either in not using force or using force. We don't like complexity. You know, for many Americans, we have the same solution to every problem, simple, quick, and wrong. And the difficulty is that when we apply it to wars, the results are a great deal more dangerous than when we apply it to the choice of a used car. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Stephanie Sanchez, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School of Government. So thank you very much for coming. I'm currently taking a class called Inclusive Security and looking at the role of women in post-conflict situations. So specifically with regard to Iraq, how would you see women's role considering they haven't been very prevalent in the military, but yet they're very prevalent in NGOs, non-government organizations, and civil society. So how are they going to be playing a role as you see it coming up in this nation building or post-conflict Iraq? Well, you need to be very, very careful. I was been in Iraq since 1973. Iraq had a carefully stylized structure for the role of women. The women's organization of the Ba'ath Party was nothing more than a facade, but fair enough. It was pretty much of a facade for the men. Women could perform, particularly after the Iran-Iraq War began, a fairly wide variety of defined tasks. And one of the oddities of this was that you ended up because of the 
drain on manpower during the Iran-Iraq War with tremendous numbers of women being trained as doctors and in professional roles, but there were not NGOs in Iraq, mm -hmm. not in the sense that most of us mean. You did have a remarkably well-educated group of people, but there weren't NGOs again for men in the sense that most of us mean. Now, what you have is you have taken the cap off all of the religious, <coughs> sectarian, and ethnic issues. We have found ourselves in the process with tremendous Islamist pressure in many areas. You've taken the cap off Shiite pressures in part of the South and off Sunni pressures in part of the West. And at the same time, you are trying to create a structure within the interim Iraqi government which expands the role of women and does give them something more than professional legitimacy in given occupations. I don't know how that's going to come out. I think, quite frankly, in many ways, it has moved beyond our control. There are only a relatively few areas, even, immediately after the war, where you could safely organize the structure for NGOs and where women could operate independently. Those areas were usually the result of having people who had unique skills and will on their own as Iraqis, support from people on the outside, many of whom were driven out of the country by late 2003, and the tolerance in individual areas of anything from Shiite clerics to people who as tribal and area chiefs were willing to put security for these groups first and ensure they could operate. In most cases, that climate does not today exist. So we cannot basically see what's going to happen. If you can create an election which creates a legitimate Iraqi government, if you can create a structure where Iraqi security and military forces can create the kind of security Iraqis want, which is not coalition troops, if you can sustain an aid effort and if you can reach a political structure which is not based on giving way to tribalism or religious extremism, you may be able to move forward again. But I can't promise you that. You may well move backwards as well. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Angel Pascual Ramsey. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. I wanted to ask you about the usefulness of calling the fight against terrorism a war. Um, I think there is many people that think that may have been a mistake for a number of reasons. First, because it seems to give a, an equal standing and a legitimacy to the other side, which may not necessarily uh, have been given. If you declare war on Al-Qaeda, the least thing you have to accept is that they have a right to be at war with you. Uh, but I think more importantly than that, it seems to render many of the legal and analytical categories with which we have been um, able to, to, to cope, at least to some degree, with armed conflict useless. Uh, you, you mentioned in your talk how, by definition, every war has to end. Well, is that the case with the war on terrorism? There is always going to be the possibility of one more attack. It also renders spatial boundaries useless. You know, w where is the battleground in the battle of terrorism? Is it New York? Is it Afghanistan? Uh, What's the difference between crime and conflict? Difference between a legal combatant and a lawful combatant. So if it, if it renders the distinctions uh, that the law of armed conflict have, uh, has provided up until now uh, useless, or at least it diminishes their analytical force, it creates a situation in which anything goes. And worrying leads to the executive power that decides what is right and what's acceptable. So with all these dilemmas that this definition of war has brought forward, do you think it was a useful thing to do? <laughs> 
I think there is a horrible illusion that legitimacy is defined in our terms. For most people in the Middle East, legitimacy at this point, according to public opinion polls, is not with us. It is with bin Laden. And that is true when you look not simply at polls conducted by people who are in the region, but groups like the Pew Organization, the Gallup Poll, and other groups. Legitimacy is a struggle for perceptions, for hearts and minds, and for values in the region. It is not something we can impose as if it was our values which had a legitimate global impact. And the same, quite frankly, is true of the idea that you can go with the laws of war as if those were values which you can simply take from the 20th century or the 19th century and suddenly say that these can again be imposed on the struggle against extremism. They can't. There is a sort of inherent hypocrisy in all of this. You know, it was perfectly fine for us to talk about the OSS or the Office of Special Services during World War II to glorify the use of non-uniform, non-combatants in the classic laws of war as the resistance throughout Europe in dealing with the Nazis. And we don't like to have to think about these comparisons. But I will tell you what bothers me most about this is these kinds of arguments are largely irrelevant to dealing with terrorist groups. You're not going to eliminate terrorist or extremist violence in the world, not given the amount of pressures and dynamics and forces that are at work. If you reduce them, it will be because you come to grips with the causes as well as with each individual movement's actions in violence. You can't define them away. You can't impose some kind of global standard and somehow think it's going to make a difference. I don't know if the semantics mattered very much. If we didn't use the term war, we'd presumably be labeled with conducting some kind of police action. If it isn't a police action, it becomes covert action. And in which case, rather than having one kind of illegitimacy, you have another. And you don't have much choice about the way you can deal with it. I think you're certainly right. You're not going to see any of these struggles easily terminated. I think you can eventually deal with Islamist extremism but it's going to be a series of struggles and it's going to probably take several decades. But it isn't going to be a matter of trying to resolve it through having new standards of international law. This is a nice academic debate to have as long as it stays nicely academic. This is an academic institution. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, uh, Dr. Mustafa Kibarola, I'm a fellow here with the Belfer Center. Actually, sir, I had the pleasure of meeting you back in Newport, Rhode Island, 2002, March, uh, where I was a panel speaker and you were the key keynote speaker during the Arc of Instability conference. And many of the remarks that you made there have been actually uh, materialized, have been uh, come to be true today, and many of the warnings that you uh, said uh, on these days uh, have become to be true. Um, I'm very much sort of inspired from your work on Iran, and my question relates to Iran, because in your concluding remarks, you said that military history teaches us as to how to engage. So uh, what does the military history and the re recent sort of accomplishments in Iraq uh, tell us about what to do with Iran's nuclear weapons program in the uh, you know, future? Thank you. I think what it teaches you is not how to deal with Iran's nuclear weapons per se, but perhaps how to deal with Iran. I find it tremendously naive to assume that Iran is not going to be far more difficult than Iraq. Should you choose military options on any broad level or try to transform it or force a change in its government, 
which would have any kind of enduring benefits to us. <coughs> the sheer scale of the problems, the population is much larger, it's more homogenous, there is more support for the ruling elite, even though it has its oppositions. There is a different kind of nationalism which is more readily apparent and will probably react more quickly. And to be perfectly honest, at this point in time, we do not have assets to play this game with any great success. We have tied up many of our low density assets throughout the force structure in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other areas. We're not ready for another major regional conflict. The various forms of preemption that people have proposed are forms of preemption which do not normally reflect any understanding of targeting. And this is a difficult subject to discuss because the level of targeting obviously depends both on having access to intelligence data and having a given level of belief in what those data are. All I can suggest is if you look at global security on the website, you will get an idea of the scale of Iran's suspected nuclear facilities, and with that, a picture of the scale of the strikes it would take to have a major impact. One key point here, too, is that the reactor being built for Iran is largely irrelevant to the history of the most direct proliferation activities. Striking at it, unlike Iraq, would not serve any great purpose. There is a question from the latest International Atomic Energy Agency report with what it is Iraq is actually doing. <coughs> and if you look at the report, it str is striking to see that one doesn't research polonium in a country like this unless one's looking for the initiator for a nuclear weapon. One doesn't develop this particular level of uranium hexafluoride by accident. You don't acquire specialized P2 centrifuges for the fun of it or create heavy water which is only needed for the kind of reactors which you are not buying for power generation. But Having said all of that, we have no ability to know where it's dispersed. We have no evidence of large-scale production facilities. We don't know what we would strike unless there is tremendously more intelligence data than I suspect are available. And if we hit at the wrong things, we're much more likely to give a new legitimacy to Iran's conservatives than we are to break up that pattern of proliferation. The other question is the aftermath. I don't believe today that with options like biological warfare and highly dispersed nuclear efforts, you can easily force a country by striking at a finite number of military targets to give up the basis for slowly creating nuclear weapons. Maybe in a few cases where they have had intelligence leaks and they've created vulnerable systems, but I think Iran has shown it is not doing that. And that gets us down to the problems of deterrence and containment and negotiation of trying to create a system of inspection which might this time work and at least partially be trusted. In other words, going back to the tactics and techniques that we did not pursue fully in Iraq, but certainly not relying on them because you are still going to need deterrence and you may, as things evolve, need defense. But there's one problem here too which bothers me. Americans often think about this in arms control terms. My general impression of arms controllers is most of them stopped thinking about 30 years ago. 
So they never bother to ask, well, if Iran's doing this, what's it, what is it going to deploy and how quickly can it deploy it? And can we tell from what it deploys the nature of the threat and how serious it is and what level of deterrence or countermeasures are required? You have to think beyond acquisition to deployment and you have to watch the process of containment and you have to mix arms control with deterrence and the threats of force and defense in the mixture that is required to respond to what actually evolves. And we have tended to compartment our thinking to be either prevention or permission. Uh, if that's our definition of arms control, we are going to fail. Uh, yeah, uh, John Brock from Harvard you know, Business School, a former a captain in the Marine Corps in Vietnam and spook. Uh, what's your uh, best guess as to the odds of Iraq devolving into a civil war? And if so, who wins? And what's the role of Iran in that, if any? They're all very good questions. I don't think it will be a classic civil war. It's possible. Somebody once described it as Somaliization, and that's only slightly better. But I think what you'll see is a lot of power struggles broken up by region. And you will see these, rather than neatly choose sides and create a civil war, lead to a series of clashes, and somebody is going to come out of that winning. Now, if we're lucky, it's the interim government, and you move forward. And if we're lucky, the plans we have to create effective Iraqi security forces begin to pay off about the end of January in 2005, and you've got enough density on the ground to really start bringing security so those clashes don't lead to major conflicts. If you really do get a breakdown, the problem is that within all of the factions, that you can name, there are still power struggles within them. The Sunnis have the problem of both trying to create some new replacement for the Ba'ath and a struggle between not only areas within the Sunni groups, but struggles between them, the theological, non-theological, people influenced by outside Islamists and people who aren't. Tribalism and other factions come in. Uh, I don't know how that's going to play out, frankly, but I cannot see the end result being stable enough to create some kind of Sunni enclave. The Shiites potentially have more power, but the Shiites, at this point in time, have not created any political movement which has broad support within it and have not been able to resolve or even define what they mean in terms of many of the theological aspects that could impact on governance. The Kurds are divided between Barzani and Talibani. I'll let you pick which you like at any given moment, but the problem with the Kurds is also that they remain relatively weak, and in their present structure, a Kurdish enclave would basically not occupy any oil area or any other area of major economic importance, and its viability that it had under oil for food wouldn't be sustained. So my guess is that if this devolves at all, it devolves into a really unstable mess, and nobody wins, basically till some strong man or other authoritarian picks up as many of the pieces as he feels is necessary. Uh, a truly sadistic Arab nationalist would allow the Kurds to be independent, but isolate them and make them Turkey's problem. So I don't have a good answer to your questions. Uh, I think, frankly, this is going to play out as an extraordinarily unstable structure. We'll know a lot more if we get the elections and we can get a, have a couple of months of aftermath. We'll know a lot more if General Petraeus is given the resources. And we'll know a lot more if we can ever get our economic aid program in gear. Thank you.
Clock to be the last question. Sure. Uh, Chuck Kogan, uh, Kennedy School. This is a follow-up to the question that came from the balcony a few minutes ago. I don't object to the idea of war on terrorism. I object to the idea of terrorism identified as something we're at war against. Terrorism is a, is a technique. It's like, this is like declaring war on landmines. Why don't we, as the 9-11 Commission has recommended, call it a war against Isla Islamist terrorism? Call it what it is. We are at war with a part of Islam, not all of Islam, obviously. Whether one would go so far as to call it a clash of civilizations is open to question. I'd like to have your comments on that, please. I think all you're doing is trading one problem for another. The wording we use with war on terrorism is far more neutral in the places where we have to fight than the idea of declaring war on Islamist terrorism, which frankly the term Islamist, even though I use it, translates into Arabic as a nightmare. And you find yourself caught up in one set of semantics that has more cultural backlash than the one you've already got. You're not going to find ways to describe this that get you around the problems. It is obvious we shouldn't call it the crusade against terrorism. <laughs> but beyond that, I think we are trying to find something that doesn't exist, a nice way to describe a set of problems that we are just coming to grips with. And I think that certainly almost all of the elements we are dealing with now are to one extent or another largely Salafi, with the exception of Hezbollah and other elements, and there are questions as to how much that is direct threat in any sense to us. But uh, I don't think we would find ourselves any better off calling it the struggle against Islamists than the war against terrorists. And we need to get used to that fact. This is a group of problems where the Islamists have the strength they do, not because they are simply Islamists, but because of the linkages to what we did in Iraq perceptions of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, perceptions that somehow the Arab and Islamic world has been bypassed in the economic development of richer states, and a host of other factors. Thank you very much. Uh, th this reminds me of the sort of the classic good news, bad news story. The bad news here is that the United States and other countries around the world continue to face very vexing security challenges, some of them thrust upon us, some of them of our own making. Uh, the ironic good news is we do have a number of people that we can count upon for intelligent and insightful and realistic things to say about them. I would like to invite you to please uh, join me in thanking Mr. Cordesman one more time for a terrific performance.